Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs gives us his thoughts on the cattle markets. Tamara Jackson Zims will discuss 2013 seed corn selection. Lowell Sandell features the 2013 Weed Management Guide. And Tina Barrett explains changes to the estate tax. First, the positive news in the cattle markets this week. Multiple reports said Japan would ease restrictions on importing U.S. beef by allowing cattle up to 30 months old enter the country. The extra 10-month window would open Japan up to nearly all beef from the United States. But in this week's market analysis, Mike Briggs questions the impact that would have. When we last talked with Mike in mid-December, cattle markets were on the favorable end of a run. When we talked Wednesday, that run had obviously ended. Pretty big roller coaster ride down, yeah. We've, and not a lot of things behind it other than that, I think the market got a little ahead of itself. Everybody's anticipating shorter supplies. And we're not, it, shorter supplies are a ways off. So I think the market got ahead of itself. I think the funds got the market got a little tired and funds started to bail and we really put a hurt on it. Just a slow ride down that hill then? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was pretty fast. You know, we knocked we knocked nine dollars and eighty two cents out of that thing in about less than ten days. It was pretty big it was a pretty big beating. The positive news in the front this or on the front this week at least to, to some is the news that Japan might open up their export restrictions to cattle of 30 months and younger, which would be a huge supply of U.S. cattle in terms of sheer numbers that it would allow to qualify for that. Absolutely, because that's over 90% of the cattle right. wouldn't qualify. I think that's, we'll have to wait to see if what that really does, because there's been times where they, they only wanted 21 month and under, and there's been more than enough supply of 21 month and under cattle for them that they did not take. So we'll see. Now, maybe that'll bring the price of those down because a lot of those 21 month and under cattle were programmed cattle where premiums had to be paid for them. And these will just be graded right out of the plant. There's no increase or extra cost on those. So maybe at a lower price point, maybe they'll buy it. But you're just not I'll sold see. it'll do that much good. I'm not really sold it'll do that much good, especially at these price points that we already are at, these elevated price points. I don't know how much, you know, cheaper is not going to be that much cheaper compared to where it's been the last few years when it was, they weren't taken at all. So we'll have to see. What are you hearing from guys that are buying feeders right now? Wow, that the feeder market is really tough. Anytime that the market shows just a little whisper that we might go higher, the feeders just take off. Now we've had this big beating in the live market and you've seen feeders come down, but you've also seen corn go up. So your margins gotten squeezed yet again. And I, and we haven't seen the feeder adjustment. And I don't know that we're going to because there's just not enough of them around. We have too much feed bunk. You know, you've seen a packer go closed in the last two, three weeks. And that was inevitable and I bet before the year's over, it's probably inevitable there will be another one because there's just too much packing capacity and there's way too much feed yard capacity too. Can you explain, you know, I don't know how this works, but can you explain to me how packers can lose money for this long and still remain open? No, I can't. Okay, that's what I no, wanted I can't. to know. That, that's thing, all, that answers my question. They do, da do, they do math different than <laughs> okay. me, I don't know. Uh, in pharmacies, a lot of corn acres, you do too. They see somewhere just over 99 million acres of corn. Uh, do you think that the corn has hit a bottom? Oh, I think corn has hit a bottom for this year because the fact of the matter is our stocks are so low. You know, we took a dive down into that crop report, the final crop report, saw where our stocks are. I don't think we're just gonna come flying out of here, but I think it just grinds higher because folks, we're short corn and that's not gonna change until the combines hit the field next year. And that's a long time away. You think it's tight until October? Oh yeah. Well, October, September, yeah. something like that, because 
there just isn't going to be any more. And if now wheat has gotten to the point where it can flow into some rations, yeah, but wheat's not going to stay down there either with this dry weather. If you you go into the spring and weather's dry like this, you're going to start seeing wheat go up too, and this thing's just going to get nasty again. The last time we talked, uh, Congress was still working on a fiscal cliff deal. They found one. Does that give you uh, any sense of confidence in a consumer and what they might do in the restaurant or in the grocery store or anything like that? I don't. I don't know what the consumer's thinking. Unemployment is still really high, but now you've finally seen the housing market go. That's a big engine in our economy. So hopefully some things will improve. You know, I know people feel better, but yet Christmas spending was not that great. And so. the paychecks are going to be lower because of the tax deals they come across. What's the good news for you at this point? Because it doesn't sound like there's much. <laughs> you know, if you've got cattle in your feed yard, I think as time goes by, we should be able to make money on the inventory that you have, provided you've got your corn locked in. But going forward, I think it, I think it's going to be really, really tough. Really tough. You're going to have to do things differently than you've you've done before because the feeder tight supply of feeder cattle is so tight, and there's so much pressure on these big corporate yards that have built all this infrastructure, and it's all hinged on them staying full. They don't stay full and they get crushed under the weight of that. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with some of these really big feed yards. Next week, we'll look at corn and soybean markets with Jeff Peterson from Heartland Farm Partners. For the second straight year, the U.S. biodiesel industry produced more than 1 billion gallons. The EPA's figures released Wednesday show 2012 production exceeded last year by 6 million gallons, but the National Biodiesel Board believes 2012 could have been even bigger. The $1 per gallon incentive for biodiesel wasn't renewed until the beginning of January, so production late last year slowed, as indicated by December's output of just 59 million gallons. The National Biodiesel Board says the gap was a missed opportunity, but with the tax credit, it expects significant growth in 2013. We talked with Tamara Jackson Zims Wednesday about the 2012 and 2013 corn crops. For last year's grain, Tamara says there are still a few things to watch while your corn is in the bin to ensure optimal quality. For 2013 planting, if you haven't selected seed yet, Tamara says disease problems in the field should play a part in your decision-making process. And I want to emphasize that the pathogens that cause some of those diseases are still out there. The conditions were not quite right during the drought of 2012 to be conducive for disease development. And so a lot of diseases were not very severe or not present at all. But it's important for us to realize they are still there and we need to select our seed accordingly. How long do they stay in the soil? Well, many of these pathogens are very well adapted and have special survival structures. They can survive for years and years without a host. And so you can't even rotate out of them long enough to completely kill them. The different seed varieties that you have a choice between, uh, is it noticeable? I mean, is there a difference in you know one end to the other? Absolutely. And, and for example, Goss's bacterial wilt and blight. Hybrid selection and selecting a hybrid that has good resistance, tolerance for that disease is the number one factor that's going to affect whether or not you get disease. We've got a lot more gray leaf spot mm. and the conditions really are going to determine whether or not we see that, but gray leaf spot's one we have trouble with year to year. What are the conditions that are conducive to those two maybe being widespread? Well, if we begin to see rainfall again in the spring and early summer, so we have higher humidity and more free moisture, that's conducive for many of the fungi to cause disease, in particular gray leaf spot. And so that's what I would watch for in the coming year. Also, if we have severe storms that may cause wounding in the corn, uh, hail, high winds, that will certainly lead to Goss's wilt development too. This drought left a lot of questions and uh, it kind of threw a lot of things at us that we didn't really know how to cover because they were unusual. Uh, aflatoxin was one of those things. We didn't know how it was going to come about. As the, the, the grain is in the bin now, does that mean it's safe from harm? Well, actually, that's a very important point. The pathogens that cause uh, aspergillus ear rot and can produce aflatoxin are alive and well. Mm -hmm. They are just like the others we talked about in that they can survive acclimate conditions. In particular, the toxin itself, if you have aflatoxin, can also continue to increase if storage conditions are not good in the bin. It's very important to maintain good storage conditions, not only now, but as temperatures begin to change and they warm up again. What are those conditions? Temperature, uh, moisture, content, w what are you looking at that would be ideal? Exactly, and so the fungi in the bin will continue to grow in the bin if the moisture is too high. If you know you had a problem in the fall with ear rot diseases, 
it's more likely that they will continue to grow and decline quality of the grain than not. And so it's important to keep that moisture below 13, 12% if possible, or just to sell it and not take the risk in general. Is it a problem you know you'd have once you open that lid, or is it one that you need to stir up the grain and do a little investigating in? I think it would be worth the time to stir it up and keep monitoring it. If you know you have a problem when you open the mm -hmm. lid, it's probably too late. Right, and what were the, uh, the, uh, the fields that, those, that that grain would have come out of mm -hmm. that would have been conducive to aflatoxin? What would those fields be? Well, those fields that are drought stressed, mm -hmm. the non-irrigated fields in particular, or ones that may have been damaged by ear feeding insects or other animals damaging the kernels. Tamara says when it comes to the 2013 season, Goss's wilt will survive even if you didn't necessarily see a lot of it in fields this past year. University of Nebraska-Lincoln Research is evaluating perennial grasses in the panhandle as a feedstock for ethanol. In the January Nebraska Farmer, you can learn about UNL Extension Soil Specialist Gary Herger and the three-year project. Herger says cellulosic materials like grasses are considered a long-term solution for ethanol production. So far, under limited results, Herger has found that a mixture including wheat grass looks to be the most productive. You can read more about the research in the January Nebraska Farmer. The 28th Annual Women in Ag Conference will take place February 21st and 22nd in Kearney. Cheryl Griffith, the project coordinator of the conference, lays out what participants can expect this year. It's amazing that more and more women um, are single landowners um, through um, maybe inheritance, uh, being a widow, whatever, but more and more women are needing to make those decisions um, on the farm and they need, uh, they need the education, the information uh, to enable them to make a good decision. Many times at, at our sessions, they will actually take the information and those that are, that are farming or ranching with their partners, they'll go home and sit down and go over the information and make some implementation changes from what they learn at the conference. The registration is at, at uh, nine o'clock. We'll begin at 9.45 on Thursday the 21st with our keynote uh, speaker, Jolene Brown. She's focusing on communications uh, within the family and the business. Um, and then, then we will go until later in the afternoon. We have some fun shops in the evening, um, entertainment with R.P. Smith. Cheryl burkhart Creasel follows up on Friday morning talking about community leaders and rural renovation and why we need to be involved in, in our rural communities. And then our capstone speaker is Temple Grandin, who uh, will be talking about uh, animal uh, issues in, in the industry. You can visit wia.unl.edu for more information or to register. Early bird registration is due February 8th. UNL's 2013 Guide to Weed Management has been released. We asked Lowell Sandell to describe the new features of this year's edition, which totals 286 pages of research results and recommendations. Well, it seems to kind of expand uh, each year. There's always, always new stuff uh, coming in. I, I think what's interesting is the first time it was published in 1960 it was a single trifold sheet and now we're up over 200 and some pages here. And colored information with weeds and everything like that. Uh, what are some of the new things that are uh, that are in this one? Yeah, so in the weed science world, uh, herbicide resistant weeds are uh, of concern uh, now. Uh, we're seeing further development in the state of Nebraska and we've uh, kind of made a special effort this year to make that information uh, more findable uh, in the weed guide. We have a color chart uh, on that towards the front uh, of the book. And then we've also added the herbicide grouping numbers to uh, the herbicide efficacy tables in all of our crop sections. There's a, a push on glyphosate resistant weeds as well. There's a section on that. Well, what we've done is we, uh, we've seen or we've confirmed uh, glyphosate resistant um, giant ragweed and kochia in the state. And we've, we now have a couple years of data on some of that. So we feel comfortable putting herbicide ratings in the corn and soybean sections, in the burn down and in the post emergence tables uh, on those glyphosate resistant weed species. For the guys or for the farmers and ranchers who maybe haven't gotten this book in five, 10 years, yeah. what are some of the things that they can see that are different from how it used to be? Yeah, so um, we've added a little more color. We've added some pictures uh, to it. Uh, somebody that hasn't purchased it in, in a number of years um, may like the fact that we've added 
uh, some uh, fungicide or disease management information and some uh, entomology and insecticide uh, information to the guide. So it's a little broader than uh, just weeds. Overall, what's the goal for this? How do, you, how do you hope that farmers and ranchers can use this or can get through the entire season with it? Well, we hope that uh, producers use it as kind of a go-to reference. I, I know most folks that, uh, that we get feedback from, they keep it uh, handy in their office and keep uh, a copy handy in their truck or in their scouting vehicle. And the, uh, the goal of it is to provide solid um, research-based recommendations to uh, the producers of, of Nebraska. And there's a science to it. I mean, you, you break down the cost by acre for a lot of these chemicals as well, yes? Yeah, you know, that's that's uh, some folks really like that feature in there. We do uh, put in the uh, comment section a suggested retail price or what it would cost per acre if folks wanted to know that information. Some folks uh, appreciate that. It's sort of a whole story thing too. I mean, it's not just the uh, the, the, the pesticides, it's also a little bit about safety as well. I was mentioning to you before, yeah. you can kind of see uh, which parts of the body get the most or get the most contact or have the most, uh, uh, I guess, danger from pesticides themselves. Yeah, the, the size of the book, it, it's really nice to put that detail of information in it. Uh, it's kind of a, 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 a hit and miss, or not hit and miss, but a positive and negative thing too, because it does get pretty big. But it, it really does have a lot of information, not only on herbicides, but on uh, safety and biology uh, information on, on weeds as well. While we have you here, it's a, uh, it's a dry off season for the most part. We're yeah. still in the midst of a drought. You know, from a weed perspective, as you start to look at the 2013 planting season, is there anything that you're keeping an eye on or anything that you think could crop up as we approach planting? Well, I, like we talked about earlier in the, in the interview, uh, herbicide resistant weeds and particular glyphosate resistant weeds, uh, we're, we're starting to see more of that popping up and uh, producers doing or putting an emphasis back on uh, good principles of weed management, controlling plants when they're small, uh, using multiple modes of action and starting that crop off weed free is going to go a long ways in helping to prevent or manage uh, resistant weed species in 2013. The 2013 guide is available for $10 on UNL's Marketplace as a hard copy. You can also view the guide for free or download a PDF for $10. We'll link to those outlets on the Market Journal website. By now, farmers and ranchers should have received a Census of Agriculture form in the mail. Those forms are to be completed by February 4th. If you received one, you're required to respond even if you don't believe you qualify as a farmer or rancher. The USDA says if you don't respond, they'll contact you by phone, mail, or in person to obtain a response. Responders can return the census by mail or through the census website at agcensus.usda.gov. In the past two shows, we've shown you how a fiscal cliff deal at the beginning of the year changed the tax landscape for farmers and ranchers. Our first interviews with Tina Barrett covered modifications to depreciation and capital gains. This week, Tina explains changes to the estate tax, which starts by featuring an overall rate increase. So there's a graduated scale, but it goes very quickly up to the top rate, and they move that from 35 to 40, but a pretty easy uh, concession for, for getting a, a extension of the $5 million level on a permanent right. basis. What does permanent mean? Yeah, here? it's a good question because permanent, <laughs> they, there's no expiration date on it. A lot of times what we've dealt with in the last couple of years is mm -hmm. we've got a two-year extension and then it expires and they have to act in order to change it. Well, this is a forever law until they change it. So um, it, it, it's going to take an act of Congress to change it. Uh, which is a much bigger difference and a much better planning tool for what we've got to deal with. As in, at the end of 2012, it would have rolled into something else, but Ex now there has to be legislation to actually change exactly. something Exactly. So, okay. yeah, instead of having this, uh, you know, whether you want to call it a fiscal cliff or whatever, instead of having something right. that we're going to fall off of and it's going to go back to a million, that's gone. The million dollars is, is no longer part of law. The five plus, somewhere around five million dollar exemption, that's also adjusted for inflation? It is. So, 2012, it went to 5.12 mm -hmm. million, and there'll be an, another index for, right. for 13, and that'll be go on. So, we shouldn't run into this problem again where we inflation out of, out of a reasonable window. The limit for gifting? Stayed at five million as okay. well. So, you have five million dollars in gifting in your life. Now, that if you do gift five million dollars mm -hmm. away, that takes away your five million dollar exclusion. Okay. So, you know, if you give, basically can give away $5 million worth of assets in your lifetime or after you're gone, 
either way, but it's still five million. Yeah, this stuff is a little a little complicated. I don't like numbers at all. <laughs> but uh, who needs to start planning for this yeah. and how? So you know, planning is going to start. I, and you know, we've been kind of putting off and holding this for three years now, not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, if you're married and your estate is over ten million, or you're single yeah. and it's five million. Now's the time that you probably should start looking at doing some good estate planning with an attorney and accountant and getting those kinds of things done so that we can come up with some strategies to lower the value of your estate. If you're married and, and it's over $5 million, it's a good idea to take a look at how things are titled, make sure that we have assets in both spouses' names so that we don't end up with one spouse passing away mm -hmm. with six million dollars of assets in their name and the other spouse having nothing. So, so are, is there something that you tell people to look at specifically when they're trying to, to, you know, when they're going into an estate lawyer or something like that? You know, I, there's a lot of people who have the ultimate solution. Certainly, you know, sure. there's a lot of life insurance salesmen out there who think that's the answer for funding this. Um, there's, you know, uh, we can get real complicated with entities and, and different ways to break mm -hmm. up the estate, which lowers the value. Um, so it's a matter of, of having somebody that you trust that's reasonable involved that um, can help you find the right balance of, of complication and expense to, to make this work for you. You can still uh, transfer to the spouse something called portability, correct? Right. They, it's something they put in the law in 2010 and they've put back in this law and, and it's again permanent mm -hmm. without action. Um, and so uh, what that allows you to do is if a spouse passes away, you're the first to die and maybe has two million dollars of of net worth, mm -hmm. the three million dollars that they left on the table could be elected to be added to the surviving spouses so they could have an eight million dollar exemption. So this works really good if you didn't get to planning right away and the spouse without a lot of assets in their name dies first, but we don't want to do that because it could go the other way. Or it also works really well so just what we've experienced in the last few years with land values, you know, and if maybe you're not in an estate tax issue right now, but if values and continue to increase or doubled again, the surviving spouse might have a problem. And so these are federal. These are federal laws, right? right. So um, Nebraska, we still don't have any estate tax, but there are county inheritance taxes which haven't changed, um, and may end up being something that's a bigger issue for a lot of people than the federal estate tax. Because of the late changes to 2012 tax law, the IRS announced this week farmers who miss the March 1st deadline won't be subject to penalty if they file and pay by April 15th. Again, the first two parts of our series on tax changes with Tina are available on the Market Journal website. And for a more detailed breakdown, you can read Tina's analysis on the Nebraska Farm Business website at nfbi.net. And now to forecast this week's weather, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. But again, before we get to the main forecast, let's take a look at what's happened during this last week. And I think the big news was the very cold air that moved into the state uh, through the weekend and into the early part of the week with some Arctic air infiltration. It did hold on a little bit longer. We did actually see some light snow break out as that cold air tried to push toward the southwest from the Dakotas. And we did see some light snow accumulations across portions of eastern Nebraska. Most areas were probably in the tenth of an inch of uh, accumulation to up to an inch and a half of snowfall accumulation. And most of that was well east of Grand Island, particularly the York over toward the Iowa border. Outside of that, we haven't had a lot of significant moisture. Unfortunately, we've started to see a warming trend as we have another system coming out of the southwest that's going to impact us this weekend with a potential of another system moving in as we get into the 29th, 30th time frame. And there's considerable uncertainty in regards to this system. And we'll have to pay close attention because a lot of times at this time of year, of course, we can see a system erupt rather quickly and drop a tremendous volume of snow. But after it passes, it looks like we go back into the deep freeze if the models are correct in the portrayal of this system. And the Arctic air returns in mass and may be hanging around for several more days as we go to the end of next week. So let's take a look at the forecast in complete detail. And as we go to the upper air models, what we'll notice is here's this trough coming in the western United States, and there's a southwest flow. There's a little couple pieces of energy that are expected to move out. We should start to see clouds increase as the day progresses. And as we get into the evening hours, as possible, we'll see some light precipitation break out across southern Nebraska and lift toward uh, portions of eastern Nebraska during the overnight hours. And in particular, as we get into Sunday, we'll probably see an all rain event across portions of eastern Nebraska, although it isn't looking very significant right now. There is a potential as we get into southeastern Nebraska, we may see a quarter inch. 
As the system lifts up in the evening, there is a possibility that we could see some light freezing drizzle as the temperatures will slowly rise during the overnight hours. And then we'll see an all rain type function as we get into Sunday. And here by Sunday, you can see this first piece of energy moving through our region. And here's the system that we're worried about. Is it starting going to start to eject toward our region, particularly as we get into Monday? And by Monday, we'll see a pretty significant trough carved out. And the possibility we'll start to see some snow accumulations, potentially in the northwestern panhandle and possibly even the southern panhandle as we get toward the afternoon hours. I think we'll see that cold front start to push its way through the state. And actually, what we will see is falling or steady temperatures over the overnight hours and by the time we get to Tuesday we'll start to see the energy sliding uh, to the east of Nebraska and the cold air will sink in so our highs are probably going to be set during the early part of the day and slowly falling from there and you can see there's a big open trough here so a lot of cold air is going to be pouring out of Canada where we have a very significant snowpack on the ground so this looks to be a very arctic air mass that's going to dive well south into the central plains and then it's going to start to shift toward the east so by Wednesday what we're going to see is now this trough starts to make its move toward the east you notice we'll see ridging in the west but this means that we're going to have a straight shot of cold air coming to our region and we might actually see some residual snow across the panhandle. We need to pay particular attention to the system because last week it was showing some significant snowstorm across the central plains only to see it disappear as we got toward the latter half of the week and now it's starting to reemerge. and then I've seen this before where these systems all of a sudden erupt into a much stronger system the closer we get to the event. So pay close attention for further updates on this system. Now as we get into Thursday, it quickly lifts off toward the northeast. We're just basically in a northwest flow where if, at best we'll see so a few scattered flurries, no significant moisture. By the time we get to Friday, we'll see that most of that northwest flow is beginning to shift over toward the Great Lakes, so we will start to see a moderating trend. So if we look at the temperature forecast, what we are looking at is temperatures are going to be well into the 40s this weekend with a chance of light precipitation on Sunday. Then we will start to see a cooling trend during the midweek, and then we'll start to see a rebound in temperatures as we go to week's end. And then if we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, we keep the cool conditions in our region, and in terms of precipitation, most of it stays well east of us. Thanks, Al. If you missed any of our interviews from today with Mike Briggs, Tamara Jackson Zims, Lowell Sandell, or Tina Barrett, you can find them on the Market Journal website and YouTube page. For updated agricultural information throughout the week, you can also follow Market Journal on Twitter and on Facebook. Next week, we'll be traveling with the Nebraska Soybean Board as part of its See for Yourself program to New Orleans. We'll see there how checkoff dollars are being used to promote the sustainability of Nebraska soybeans. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska.